also want to welcome everybody that's tuning in online. My name is David. I, I serve as the lead pastor here, and uh, so excited to have you as our guest this morning. So we've been going through a series in a book called Philippians, uh, and the series is titled Partners in the Gospel. And last week, we left off t- talking about uh, what our confidence is in when it comes to our relationship with God. And what we learned from this amazing little letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church is that our confidence, uh, for anyone that's a believer in Christ Jesus, our confidence needs to come from the reality that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that we are declared righteous uh, because of what he did for us on the cross. Amen? Like, we don't bring anything to the table. It's not our good works. It's not how, how great we are. It's all about what Christ has done for us. And that's what we learned about last week. And so we're going to continue in chapter 3. we got four verses that we're going to look at today. And I'm going to be honest. I don't know if we're going to get through all four. Uh, because there's so much in, uh, in, that, that's just jam-packed in these four verses. And so I'm going to do my best uh, to get through these verses, and um, but I don't want to rush through it at the same time. I want the Holy Spirit just to speak uh, through these verses. And so um, we're looking at chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. And uh, you could read this along uh, in your Bibles or on the slides. Paul says, my goal is to know Christ, the righteousness, or my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Then he goes on to say, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do forgetting what is behind and reaching toward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. You know, sometimes reading Paul's writings, especially as I've just been going through this series, man, they are so challenging, especially just knowing the context of where Paul is writing this letter from. You know, we've learned already that he's in a prison cell. He's attached to soldiers day and night. And he's under house arrest. He doesn't know if he's going to face martyrdom, if he's going to face death because of preaching the gospel. And yet he just seems to be in such good spirits throughout this whole scenario, right? And it's convicting. It's challenging, you know? And, And what we've learned about Paul is that, man, Paul had this amazing encounter years before where he was persecuting Christians, and then one day as he's on his way to persecute Christians, we know the story back in Acts where Jesus literally, the resurrected Jesus appears to him, and he has this revelation of who Christ is and what the gospel is all about, and his life is forever changed, and it marked him. And I think that really just just changed his perspective on everything, and that's why when he's sitting here in a jail, he says, my goal isn't to get out of jail. My goal isn't to, like, be successful in life. My goal isn't to, you know, go out and escape martyrdom. He says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Man, that's challenging. Honestly, I I told David Collinsworth this this past week, I was like, man, this is a challenging one. And, and, And as we look at this, I want us to look at just realizing that here Paul is, and he, and we need to understand, like he is saved by God's grace, right? He's already declared, man, he's righteous through God. So he's not trying to earn salvation in any way, but there's something within Paul that's like, that has this desire to not just camp out in his salvation, to not just go like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to heaven. I'm good. I could just coast through life. I could just live life as a nominal, normal Christian, right? No, there's something within him that desires. And so I I want us to look at three observations from these four passages of Scripture today. And the first one is this, is this goal to know Christ. He says, my goal is to know him. My goal is to know him. I recently read some statistics about goal setting. Is there any goal setters in here? You guys like, you know, goals? Okay, cool. We have a a bunch of um, 
procrastinating people, that's fine. All right. Uh, don't have any goals. Okay. But there's five people that have goals. Awesome. So maybe you fit within these statistics, but 83% of respondents don't have goals. <laughs> Go figure. Um, 14% of people had plans, but they didn't write them down. And only 3% had written goals. How many of you that raised your hand that said you had goals, you have written goals? Okay, so, yep, you're the 3%. You're way better than all of us. Awesome. Check this out, though. Research has shown that you are 42% more likely to achieve your goals if they are written down. And so you should write your goals down. And here we, we see Paul in this instant, and he has written down his goal for life. He has written down what his purpose in life is, what it's all about, and he says, my goal is to know him. Man, think about that. Sitting in jail under dire circumstances, and he's like, I want to know Christ more. And, you know, as we think about it, it's like, man, Paul, you, you know Christ. He's like, yeah, but I, I want to know him more. And so what does he mean by this? And we understand, guys, as Christians, if you're a believer in here today, that you can know Jesus even more. As a matter of fact, he invites you to know him more. Jesus said that this is eternal life, that they may know you, right? And, and, and if we've been saved by God's grace, man, we are invited into this relationship, this eternal pursuit of finding our joy and our satisfaction, our purpose and our identity and intimacy within Christ Jesus. Paul knew that there was nothing else better than knowing Jesus. As a matter of fact, that word know, it, it means uh, it's more than just intellectual knowledge. It, it means to have more of an experience. I kind of liken it to this. Um, so call me weird, but I, I, me and my wife, we like all things British, okay? Uh, there's actually a word for that. It's called Anglophiles. It's a true, you can look at, you can Google that later, okay? Um, don't worry about that. Um, but, but we like British stuff. We just like British comedy. We like British mi murder mysteries, you know, all, all these things. It's like, and, we, and, and even food, right? And when I was a kid, I had a chance to eat this amazing uh, side dish called Yorkshire pudding. Anyone know what a Yorkshire pudding is? It is not like jello pudding, okay? It's like this bread, do doughy bread. I can't even explain it. And English people, if you're watching, and I said that wrong, I'm sorry. I don't know if I pronounced that right. But it's Yorkshire pudding, it's amazing. It's so good. And me and my wife, we've talked about it. And my wife recently found a, a uh, recipe to make Yorkshire pudding. Here's a problem, though. My wife has never had Yorkshire pudding. That, that's no knock on her, but as she wants to make it, I'm like, you can't really make it unless you've tasted it, right? You're not going to know of it, right? And so, and so there's a difference between knowing about something and then tasting it. And this is what this word know means. Is there's a difference between just head knowledge about who Jesus is and, and knowing a lot of facts about him and knowing, even knowing scripture verses, but then to really experience this intimate fellowship, this communion with him, tasting the goodness of God. And that's what Paul has in mind here. And he says, I want to know Christ. My goal is to know him more than anything else. And he echoes what David said, how David in the Psalms said how he desired the Lord like a deer pants for the water. Moses said, show me your glory. Jeremiah said this, the prophet Jeremiah said, this is what the Lord says, the wise person should not boast in his wisdom, the strong should not boast in his strength, the wealthy should not boast in his wealth, but the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Listen, friends, God wants you to know him more. He wants you to find your joy, your satisfaction in him. Amen? A.W. Tozer said this, he said, to have found God and to still pursue him is a soul's paradox of love. To have found God and to still pursue him. And my question for us today on this point is how many of us have kind of just gotten cold in our walk with Christ? Maybe we've left our first love. Maybe we've just kind of been complacent. Maybe we're just not like desiring to know him and we're just kind of coasting. And, and God is inviting you to know him more today. That's what he desires. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that everything is wrapped up in knowing him. And then listen to this, what he goes on to say. He says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection. 
So not only can we know Christ personally, but we can know Christ powerfully, his power. And that's what Paul says. He says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection. That word power is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. And we've talked about this before in the past, but Paul uses this term a lot all throughout his letters because he understood what it meant. And he says, it's the power, the dunamis of the resurrection. We know that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's what Christianity hinges on, right? If Christ was not raised from the dead, there'd be no Christianity. But listen to this. Paul says elsewhere, he says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in us. This dynamite power. And Paul says, listen, I, I want to not only know Christ more, but I want to know this power even more that's within me. It's, it's this power to live victoriously. It's this power to live, overcome sin and temptation. It's this power to get through difficult circumstances and hardships. And, and Paul says, I want to know this more. I want this to become more of evident in my life, this, the power of his resurrection. And we see just several scripture verses. I'm going to skim through these really quick of where Paul uses the same word and we, won't, we don't have time to, to say all of them today but in Ephesians 1.19 the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us Philippians 2.13 this power is now working in us uh, to work according to God's pleasure 2 Peter 1.3 says this power enables us to live a godly life Colossians 1.11 this power also gives us strength to endure life's hardships 1 Peter 1, 5, this power has secured our salvation forever. And Paul says, man, I want to know not only Christ more personally, but I want to know his power that's within me as he's going through life, right? God desires that we know this power so we can live victoriously, so that we can overcome things. And listen to this, he goes on to say, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, some people were like, you know, we, if you're anything like me, you're like, yeah, I want to know his power. I want to know Christ more. And then I just kind of want to skip over this part that I just read in the fellowship of his sufferings. Like, let's be honest, who in here likes to suffer? <laughs> nah, no, none of us do. But, but here's the reality, guys. We, we live in a broken world, and so we will experience hardship and tribulation, right? And, and, and listen, there's, there's this false theology out there called this prosperity gospel where, Christ, where they say that Christ died for our health, our, our wealth, and, and for our success, okay? Now listen, I believe in healing. I do believe that God is a good father. He provides according to his riches and glory and meets our needs. I do believe in that. I do believe when we work hard and we commit things to the Lord, he, he does bless us. However, this is not like a guarantee all the time, right? We live in a broken world because of sin. And so we experience sickness. We experience obstacles. We experience tragedies. We experience hardships. And it's not until we get to heaven that, man, every tear is going to be wiped away. And in the meantime, listen, friends, we need to understand, we need to have a good theology and understanding of suffering. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. As a matter of fact, Paul actually talked about this uh, a couple verses earlier where he tells them in Philippians 1.29, he actually tells them this. He says, for it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, which we're like, yay, well, yeah, I get to believe in him. But to also suffer for him. He tells the Philippian church, hey, you're going to experience hardships. You're probably going to face persecution. And, and, and so we need to understand this idea that as Christians, we're never going to experience pain and tragedy is just false. It's a false theology. Nor is it true that just because you experience pain and tragedy is because you don't have faith and you are in sin. That's not true either, okay? There's a balance. But we need to understand what God does in the midst of our suffering. We need to understand that Christ can meet us in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our suffering. Paul says 
and the fellowship. That word fellowship, we've seen this word all throughout Philippians where it's this Greek word koinonia, which means partnership. It means sharing. It means partaking. And, he, and so what he's meaning here is this fellowship that we experience with Christ in the midst of suffering. It's this idea, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the middle of the fire, Christ is there. When we're going through hard times, we can experience a deep communion with Christ. That God has not abandoned us. Paul says, in the fellowship of suffering. Friends, we've all experienced suffering because this world is broken. Suffering from our past trauma, from our past brokenness, for things done to us, from our own sins, our own mistakes, maybe a sickness, it's, it's disease, whatever it is, maybe it's death. Life sucks sometimes. I know that very well. Most of you guys know my mom recently just passed away from cancer. And we're grateful that she's in heaven, but man, Suffering is real. But the hope for us as believers is that in the middle of suffering, God can meet us in our pain. He can be with us in the fire. And that is such good news for us. And Paul is saying, listen, he knows that he's, I mean, he's in jail right now, so he's experiencing suffering. He knows things aren't going to get easier for him. And so he talks about this idea that, that even in the midst of this pain and tragedy, that I could experience this fellowship this partnership. Joni Erickson Tata, she's this woman of God who has this incredible ministry. She's actually a quadriplegic. And she experienced getting paralyzed from a, uh, when she was a teenager, she, she had this diving accident. She thought she was diving into deep water and ended up diving into shallow water, and left her paralyzed. And if you know anything about her story, you know that she believes in God's healing. They've had people pray for her, all these things, but, but, but God hasn't done it. But she's used this, and she's allowed this experience to be a witness that God is still good, that he's still working everything out. And listen to what she says about this idea of this fellowship of suffering. She says this, it means it's a mystical participation together with Christ. It's a marvelous mystery that Jesus feels the sting in his chest when you hurt. Jesus understands your suffering. He understands it. Paul goes on to say the fellowship of suffering being conformed to his death. This idea of being conformed, this is the, the goal of the Christian life is to become more like Christ. Romans 8 tells us that we've been predestined and called to be to be. Uh, to be um, conformed to the image of his son, to, to look more like Christ in our lives. And here's the thing. Listen, I love it when God does miraculous things and he does heal people and he can do it. If you're sick here today, man, we're going to pray for that. We, we believe in that, right? But even, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't answer our prayers, we could also know that somehow in the midst of this hard trial that we may be facing, God is working all things out. And he's using it somehow, forming us. Christ suffered on the cross. We just sang that song, The Passion of Our Savior. That's where the word passion comes from, the, the crucifixion. He suffered. He was a man of sorrows, as Isaiah says. And he submitted to his Father's will. And Paul is saying, in the midst of suffering, may, 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 I just be, may, may God use it for his glory. May, may I be more formed into his image. So the goal is to know Christ. And he goes on to say in verse 11, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. What is he saying here? Is he questioning whether or not he's ever going to face, uh, if he's going to go to heaven? No, that's not what he's saying. He says somehow, meaning he knows that he doesn't really know the circumstances as to how he's going to face death one day. He knows it's coming, but listen to this. He says, he talks about the resurrection from among the dead, and this is the promise for us as believers, right? We want to cling to this world so tightly, but friends, we need to understand something, that one day there's a new heavens and new earth that's going to be made for us. 
When we die, we get to be with the Lord, and we get to, you know, if we, we die on this earth, one day when Jesus comes back, man, our bodies are going to be resurrected, and we're going to be with him for all eternity. And Paul is essentially saying this is the, the, the climax of truly knowing Christ, of truly knowing his power, is when we experience this resurrection one day. And that should give us some hope, right? That in this world we have trouble, but as Jesus said, take heart. I have overcome the world. He says that, he talks about among, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. So listen to this. Then he goes on to say in verse 12, not that I have already reached the goal. Okay, keep in mind the goal. What is the goal? Goal of knowing Christ, right? Or I am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. So what is he saying here? If the goal is to know Christ, and then he says, but I haven't reached the goal. So here's the second observation we can see from this text is that we will never reach the goal completely in this lifetime. We will never arrive of completely knowing him. There's so much to know about Jesus. And, and Paul realizes this, man, I, I'm never going to be complete. I'm not going to arrive there. I haven't arrived. I don't know him like I want to know him. I don't know the power of his resurrection like I want to know. I, I don't know, you know, what it's like not to suffer and, and, try, and go through trials and struggle with temptation. Paul realizes that. And listen, just a little side note. This is the apostle Paul we're talking about. So if he didn't reach it, how much more should we be like, dang, Right? So beware of any, any super Christian that's out there that talks all super spiritual and they're like, they're like I have reached the goal. I, I know Jesus more than all of you and I know the power of his resurrection and I could get through anything in life. I could float on the cloud, right? You ever been around those kind of people? Listen, nobody has reached it. Paul says, I, I, I'm not perfect. He says, not that I have already reached a goal or, am I, or I am already perfect. There is no perfect saint no one has reached full spiritual maturity. We are all on the same playing field. Some of us maybe know Jesus a little bit more than others, but we are not any better than anyone else. And Paul said that. He said, I haven't reached a goal. But listen to this. That's not an excuse for him. What does he say? But I make every effort to take hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. So he's like, man, my goal is to know Christ, but I realize I haven't, I haven't, I'm not there yet. I want to be there. I want to know him more. But that's not an excuse. I'm going to keep taking hold of it. That word take hold literally means like a close-handed fist to, 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 to see something with dear life. I'll never forget when I was in Bible college, me and a couple of my, my friends, we went out on a boat. There was this like wealthy family that had like this really nice boat. And um, stupid us, we, the, the teenage boy of the family decided to be the driver that day, which was not great, because he had every intention of embarrassing us. And so he was pulling us on this speedboat like we were on this gigantic tube, and we'd go one by one, and you know, we, we'd be holding on. I mean, he'd take off. He was trying to drown us in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Like, he was trying to let us be eaten by sharks, okay? So my turn came around, and I get on there, and I literally, I'm like, uh-uh, I'm going to let this sucker, like, knock me off here. And so, like, I, I literally took the rope. I wrapped it around my hands, on my arms, and I held on for your dear life. And I'm telling you, man, I don't know how long that ride lasted, <laughs> but I was skimming across the water. The tube was flipping, and, he, and it, you could see him. He was getting frustrated that he couldn't knock me off, right? He was just like, and he'd speed up even faster, take a sharp turn. I mean, I held on for dear life because I, I don't like sharks, okay? And so, and I seized it. And that's the idea Paul is saying here. He says, I, I make every effort to take hold of this, to pursue Christ because he's better than life. And then listen to this, though. Because he has taken hold of me. This is crazy. He uses the same exact word of this, this, this seizure, this, this close-handed grip. He says, I, I, I have this close-handed grip on Christ. Why? Because he's holding on to me tightly. Man, that is the good news for us as believers. Is that Jesus is holding on to us. That we are in the middle of his hand. And no one can snatch us out of his hand. This should give us great assurance. 
right? Listen, Paul is not saying I'm doing all this to earn my salvation. No, he knows he's saved. He knows that he's been gripped by the hand of God. And so therefore he's pursuing everything that he has in Christ. And so listen, our eternal security should motivate us to continue to pursue Christ, to persevere, to hold on tightly. Charles Spurgeon said, holding firmly, I am held, right? And it's this idea that Jesus is holding on to us. And and so Paul took hold of this. And so listen to this. In verse 13, I can't believe this. I may get done with all four verses. This is fantastic. Some of you guys must, there there must be like deep intercession somewhere in this building today uh, that someone's praying, Lord, please let him get done with all four verses. Um, But listen to this. Here's the last observation about this. All right, the goal is to know Christ. The second observation is that we are never going to completely reach that goal in this life. But here's the third one. This goal is worth pursuing. Listen to what he says here in verses 13 and 14. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. So here he is. He's, he's emphasizing this again. I haven't arrived yet, guys. Neither have you. Right? I, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of everything. To, I don't consider myself to have really know Christ like I want to, to know the power of his resurrection, to know the fellowship of his sufferings, to be more conformed, and to be more like him. I, I, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it. But listen to this, but one thing I do. One thing. That word one thing in, in the Greek means a concentrated purpose. This one thing, David said in in the book of Psalms, he said, one thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. This one thing, this one desire, this one single purpose, essentially this was his why, right? You probably, if you've been in the business world, you probably heard that expression about start with your why, what's your why? And this was his why, this one thing, to know Christ. This is my concentrated purpose. This is my focus. This is my aim. This is this is all that life means to me. And listen to this, okay? He says, forgetting what is behind and reaching toward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Paul, as you, if you're familiar with Paul's writings, he, he liked to use like, um, race analogies like you know he talks about running the race you know he's finished the course you know he 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 used a lot of athletic metaphors right because he lived in this greco-roman culture where the olympics first started and and so they he saw these things taking place these competitions right and so he says i pursue as my goal the prize and so this idea here is running a race and we're going to come back to this in just a second Okay? But it's this idea of running towards the finish line. But listen to this. This is his pursuit, this goal, right? I, I pursue my goal, the goal of knowing Christ, the, the goal of being more like him, knowing his power, all these things. I pursue it, right? But listen to what he does first. And I think this is so applicable today. I really feel like this is for many of us here today. I know it was something for me this week. Because in order to pursue this, listen to what he says here, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. Listen to this. Forgetting what is behind. What is Paul meaning here? Is he saying, hey, forget your past hurts. Forget what's been done to you. Forget your pain. Forget your tragedy. Forget your, your, your sin. Is he saying, like, completely erase it from your memories? No. What he has in mind here is this idea of stop looking back at it. See, because, again, in the context of what Paul's talking about here, he's talking about pursuing. He's talking about running a race. And here's the thing. My sister was a four-time state uh, track at, uh, um, champion, set records in Florida for the 100 meters. And, and one thing I knew, you know, watching her, She's not as fast anymore. Um, you know, she's a lot older. She, anyway, that's a dig. If she's watching, there you go. But, but she, when she used to run, I man, she was super fast. And one thing that she learned to do is to never look back. Because it would hinder your focus from finishing the race. 
As a matter of fact, this, this is the exact scenario that took place in, uh, in 1954 during the British Empire Games in Vancouver, Canada. You had two of the fastest men in the world r- competing uh, what is known as the Miracle Mile. They ran a mile, and they were the two fastest guys. Uh, they, they had both ran um, sub-four-minute miles. They had b- both ran the fastest sub-four-minute miles in the world at this time. There's this Englishman named Roger Bannister and this Australian named John Landy. And as they were running, okay, they're coming up on the final lap. And John Landy, he, he takes off, man. He's, and so Roger is, you know, he, he's trying to follow and catch up. And it looks like John Landy's going to win. Roger even thinks this. But for whatever reason, John Landy says later on, he didn't hear Roger behind him. And so he turned around and looked, just like you see in this picture. And as he was looking, Roger sped up around him and beat him by five yards. Friends, listen. Paul is saying we've got to stop looking back in order so that we can continue to pursue who Christ is and embrace all that he has for us. For some of us, the enemy likes to keep reminding us of our past mistakes. And we're like, man, God never, I I can't be close to God. You know, I can't be, you know, I can't know Christ like Paul does because because of my past. He keeps reminding us of our past sins. For some of us, he keeps reminding us of just our past brokenness and things that have been done to us and trauma, all these things. And and he he reminds us of insecurities. He reminds us of just tragedy and and all these things. And and we're having this, we're, we're, we're struggling in our walk right now in the present because why we keep looking back instead of looking at what Christ has for us, of who we are in Christ, of all the blessings we have. And so Paul's saying, hey, stop looking back. Listen to this in Hebrews uh, chapter 12. It says, therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance in the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith this idea. Stop, stop holding on to things. Stop looking to your past mistakes, to your past self-righteousness even, to your own morality. Stop, stop looking at these things and, and pursue. He says reach forward, and, and that's another term in, in the original Greek. It literally has this idea of a sprinter who's leaning forward with his neck to, finish that, to, to cross the finish line, to reach forward and Paul's saying, listen, man, the enemy would like nothing more than to defeat us with the things that are behind us. And friends, listen, if you're in Christ Jesus today, your past is not relevant. Your past mistakes, your past failures. Man, the enemy wants to hold on to things. Listen, I, I know this all too well. I, everything that, like this past month, going down and traveling back and forth um, to my family, dealing with my mom as she's struggling with cancer. Like, it was crazy in, in so many ways because, hey, you ever go back home and it's like, yeah, you haven't been, I haven't, I, throughout the years, my parents have typically come up and see, seen us and all this stuff. So I haven't been home a lot. And so it was crazy being there for several weeks. And it was just like, man, I felt the enemy just, just reminding me so many things from my past, sins, my brokenness, things, my hurts, all these things, right? And it just became so real to me. And, and, and I'm just going to be completely honest. Like even this past week, I was talking to a Christian therapist. By the way, I wholeheartedly believe in that. I think this is one of the tools that God uses to help us get past our past. And it was so crazy because I, in preparation for this message, I didn't realize I was going to be sharing this with you guys. But just in that, it was like this Christian therapist was just, he was reminding me, Hey, listen, that's not your past. Your past doesn't define you anymore. This is who you are in Christ now. This is, this is who, this is, you're a child of God. Like all these things, like things that I always tell you guys, like things that I needed to be reminded about. Because our past can be powerful, can't it? The pain of our past. 
It's so easy to hold on to things, and I, I am not excluded from this, as I recently just realized how much my past has even affected me, and it's like, man. But see, what the enemy wants to do is cripple us. Adrian, Adrian Rogers, a great Baptist preacher, he says, Satan binds us to the past, but Jesus frees you for the future. Friends, your past doesn't define you. And listen, it may take some time, some healing to deal with things. That's okay. God is committed to the process. If you need to talk to someone like a Christian therapist or a pastor or, or a counselor or a friend or, or in, your, in, in your Discover Point group, man, do it. We all have things that we are dealing with. And I feel like there's many of us that have been held by our past. We've been holding on to things. Satan keeps reminding us about our past. And God is saying today, hey, your past no longer defines you, so stop looking at it. Reach for the prize. Pursue the goal, right? He says, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ. Again, this word pursue means to press hard, to run swiftly after and the goal this the, the prize is this goal of knowing christ i press on to find my purpose my identity my satisfaction my joy my wholeness my everything in christ jesus and one day friends listen here, here's the cool thing about this race the race is already fixed. <laughs> it's already fixed for us. God's already won. We already get the prize at the end. And one day, we're going to receive this trophy, which is Jesus Christ himself, and we're going to see him face to face, and we're going to be transformed into his likeness. We're going to know him, all of our pain, all of our trauma, all of our hurts, all of our insecurities, all of our brokenness, all of our sickness, all of our disease, all cancer, all of death is going to be defeated in that moment. Amen? Amen. Friends, this is the prize. This was what Paul was pursuing, and in this moment, the call is for us is to pursue that, to keep Jesus as our focus, as our center, as our everything. He says, I press on, I, I, I pursue the prize, promised, promised, it's promised to us, by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. What is that heavenly call? It's the call of the gospel that, that has went out. When you, when you heard the good news of Jesus and you responded to that call to repent and you did that, you repented and you believed in Jesus, that heavenly call took root in your life and we were now promised this prize at the very end of our lives. Friends, this is a goal worth pursuing. So as we're getting ready to close today, I just want to ask a couple questions for us to think about. The first one is, is your goal to know Christ, believer? Is that your goal? Man, make that your goal. Not, and I don't say that in like a, like beat you over the head, like you're worthless if you're not pursuing Christ, if you're not reading your Bible. I don't want, no, I don't want to get into legalism, like all that stuff. It's just like, man, just, just focusing and realizing and being reminded that this is what it's all about that we have everything we need in Christ Jesus. Is that your goal today? The second question is this. What do you keep looking at? What do you need to forget? What do you need to stop looking back at? What are the things that the enemy keeps reminding you and keeps trying to bring them into your focus as you're running this race? What are those stumbling blocks? What are those hurts? What are those hindrances? What are, what are those sins? What are those compromises? What is or even maybe even self-righteous that you keep trying to add to your faith? Like I'm, you know, trying to add more, all these things and because you think that Jesus isn't enough. Like, what is that? What do you just need to lay aside today at the foot of the cross and take your eyes off of it and focus on Christ? And the third question is, 
for anyone maybe that's not a follower of Jesus today, as I just said, there's this heavenly call, and today heaven is calling out to you to respond, to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is everything that you are looking for, everything that you need. And it starts by you repenting of sin, repenting of, of the things of that you've done against God and and realizing though that Jesus already paid the penalty for your sin and just receiving him today. We're going to close here and in just a moment we're going to have some some of our faith coaches up front that would love to pray with you about one of those three areas. Maybe it's to just know Christ more. Maybe you just want to spend time worshiping Jesus on your own. Some of you, maybe you need to just come forward and you need to to say, hey, I've been struggling with things from my past or the enemy keeps reminding me. Others of you, maybe you're like, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. Either way, our faith coaches are going to be up front and they would love to talk with you and pray with you this morning. I want us to just bow our heads and close our eyes right now. Our worship team's getting ready to come up and join me. Father God, we come to you right now and we thank you. We thank you that heaven called out to us by grace. And that when we responded in faith that Jesus, you took hold of us. For those of us who are, your, who are followers, that's such good news that nothing can separate us from your love. We don't do anything to earn our salvation. But it's, and it's also good news to know that we can know you even more. That we could find our identity, our purpose, our wholeness, our joy, our satisfaction in this amazing relationship with you. And I pray that you would stir our hearts, oh God. May we be a church that's passionate about you, Jesus, that loves you. Lord, for anyone that's here today that's maybe been struggling with their past. The enemy has been reminding them of things. And God, I pray that you would do a work in healing. May, may you start a work today. Lord, and for those that don't know you, God, I pray that right now in this moment they would receive you. If that's you, friend, and you say, man, I want to know Christ today as my Lord and Savior, would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray with you today. You just say, I want to know Christ. Just raise it up high. The lights are dim. No one's looking around. I want to make him the Lord of my life. Thank you. Just raise it up high. I just want to pray with you. If you've got your hand raised or you're ready to make that next step, I want you to just repeat this with me. Just say, Jesus, I surrender to you today. I receive you as my Lord and Savior right now. In your name, amen. Why don't you guys stand up with me? I'm going to ask our faith coaches to come forward. And friends, if you need prayer for any of those things today, as we sing a song of worship and response, I want you to come forward. If you want to take communion as a follower of Jesus, feel free to do that as well.